Thank you so much for joining us, the viewers. This is our weekly program, Diplomacy, and I'm come on the move by hosting this program for you. Have a good time with us. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jamalasan. And Dr. Jamalasan is an Ethiopian born scholar who is currently living in the United States of America. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamal, for joining me. And I'll have a very good time with that or with me. And today we'll discuss mostly about the national dialogue that the country Ethiopia is proposing. And welcome to this program again. Um, Mr. Rukaba, uh, thank you so much for having me on this Spotlights and OBN English program and the staff members. I appreciate your time for having me on here. All right. I know you are requesting for this national dialogue from the very beginning. In the first place, why Ethiopia need a national dialogue in your perspective or in your view? Why Ethiopia needs a national dialogue? Personally, I do think, as you said, of course, I have actually the first time that I, I wrote a paper on Ethiopian national dialogue was when I was uh, at the University of Minnesota about 13 years ago. So for Ethiopia, in a nation like Ethiopia, very diverse and with very ugly past, I think it is very important to have national dialogues with um, uh, very humble um, beginning from diverse, from all ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds, even with gender diversity it is very important to have a national dialogue for ethiopia to have very strong constitution and um, bright future uh, that's what i believe a national dialogue is very important what kind of um, uh, national dialogue is advisable for the country like ethiopia for a nation like ethiopia it is very important see i have um, been paying attention, very close attention with what's going on with even uh, since they started doing these uh, national dialogues. In my opinion, in a nation like Ethiopia that is very diverse, over 85 different ethnic groups and multilingual and cultural and religious diversity, it is very important to have this diverse group in terms of um, ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds and geographical locations, even within Oromo community. We have very um, diverse people, even within only one uh, community. So it is very important. Mm -hmm. For example, say that um, uh, from Southern nations and nationalities, recruit people with, um, uh, who have a scholarly background and a religious background. And then even langu uh, linguistically, just like as the, uh, in uh, Oromia region, even within Amara region, you have to recruit people based on their uh, religious, well, of course, religious diversity with, within uh, Christian communities. They have Baptists, I believe, and Orthodox, and it is very important to have even these branches together. And when they do so, then they have to start from, I mean, together at the same time. It is not like organizing Amara communities and Oromo communities separately, and then they come together. No, they have to start together. The reason why is Ethiopia is really divided since day one. And as Oromos, we have always, especially the last 150 years, that's where our history begins. As I've been hearing this, I'm 36 years old. So since for the 150 years we have been going through and we have been this group did this to us and this group. So we have this ugly past, whether we like it or not. Another ethnic groups too, those ethnic groups too, they have their own ugly past too. It is very important to come together at the early stage, even when they select people. How can we do this? Where can we do this? So they have to start from very, uh, beginning when they select people. Then people emotionally, they can communicate with one, with one another and break down if they want to emotionally and they cry with one another. And through reconciliation comes from that very diverse and from very beginning. It is not like, for example, let's say that or we're going to have national dialogues. Why don't we have Oromo community here and Amara community there? They can communicate after a few months and come together. No, they need to come together at very beginning. Everyone needs to hear 
what Oromon is to say what they need to say in front while Amaras are there. And Amara communities need to say what they need to say while Oromo communities are there. So that is where the true reconciliation comes, uh, really uh, takes place, I, according to what I believe and according to what I've been doing research from South African uh, reconciliation, if you look at it, their uh, literature, and even Rwandans. So true reconciliation, again, has to come Everyone has to come together, not, when I say everyone, not every Ethiopians, but their selected community leaders. And also I do recommend that it should be very young generation who can do research, for example, recruit this young generation who can do research about Dutch community, about American civilization, American community, American um, uh, liberal community and the conservative community where they can do research and compare this democracy to Ethiopians, even take South Africans. That's how you, we should, that's how Ethiopians should um, come together to have true reconciliation and then draft the final constitution. If you look at the Ethiopian history, at every, every political leader in that country, they, have, they draft their own way of life until they are there. And when they are gone from Mangisto Haile Marim, then even from Haile Selassie, from Melilik, up, up to, uh, until up to Malas Zenawi. After the leader is gone, everything changes. Everything changes. So I think we need to stop this. This um, national dialogue should be where everyone comes together willingly and they draft their final constitution for Ethiopia. So Ethiopia will have final constitution for 300 years and 400 years to come, or even million years to come. That's my, um, that is a kind of um, uh, reconciliation and national dialogue I would like to see. And also women, women need to participate in this too. I want to hear you comment on the ongoing process of the national dialogue and the way forward, what should be done in the future in order to succeed this national dialogue, what is expected from all the stakeholders, from the government and from the stakeholders going to participate on this national dialogue, what is expected from all? It should be that this is not about, um, this national dialogue is not about it is either my way or your way. It is about coming together and collaborating, honestly collaborating, communicating and a compromise. When we compromise, compromisation is not, if somebody wants to have banana for a snack, somebody wants to have pineapple or other person would like to have apple, it is not that everybody should have their way. Compromisation is like, how can we do this, come together to have just one snack or two snack for, I mean, one or two fruits for a snack. If the groups agree to have all of them, that is fine with compromisation. So it is not that Oromo community is coming together with all this painful past and saying, you know what, we have been going through painful, um, uh, history in this country, it has to be on our way. No, Amara community is not going to say that or that community. So it is about building the nation. When we build the nation, it is not, they shouldn't focus so much about what is going to happen today or next five years. It should be next 500 years. The constitution that will be there for years to come for generations. It is a time for Ethiopian communities. I don't care where Ethiopians come from and what kind of language they speak and what they look like. It is about all of us is home. We need to build a long-term home where we can say for once and all, we are done with this war. In my life, I'm 36 years old. When I was only six years old, my father was assassinated because of this political corruption that is still going on right now. And for the last four years, how many Oromos alone have been literally losing their beautiful life? And how many um, 
uh, businesses and houses have been burned down for the last four years. It was the same thing 30 years ago, the same thing 40 years ago in that country in the last 150 years. This should be a time that we say this cycle, this cycle of violence, this cycle of poverty, this cycle of political corruption needs to end now for once and all. If we don't do this honestly, uh, Dr. Abi Ahmad wouldn't be there for 100 years. Once he leaves, we're going to have the same, the same cycle that we had 30 years ago and 150 years ago and 60 years ago. So now, this national dialogue should be, we are done, we are tired, enough is enough. Ethiopia, the oldest country on the planet, today we remain the poorest nation. And when I was in that country, 85% of Ethiopians, the way I looked at them, I literally, I said, God, why am I here? So the people, this is smart and brilliant people who cannot even afford to eat three, three times a day, that is shame. Right, I came, I came back from Ethiopia, I did research. In Addis Ababa alone today, there are over 50,000 homeless people on the streets. About 12,000 of those homeless people are children of all ethnic backgrounds, all Ethiopian children. And about 60% to 70% of those are females and children on, on those streets. It should be shame. This is shame on us. So everyone who comes to these national dialogues should put their egos out there, as Warren Buffett said, let us plant a tree that we are not planning to sit under that, it is shade. When we plant that tree, we should be planting for our office rings, for our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. If we come to these national dialogues with that mentality, I can assure you, we can create the best constitution in the best nation for all Ethiopians. So I ask everyone who comes to these national dialogues to put their egos out there, their political, uh, toxic politics behind, and they come together to focus on building countries for all Ethiopians, for Oromos, Amaras, Tigris, Somalis, and all Ethiopians. All Ethiopians means everyone who lives in that, in that country belong to that nation. Is the dialogue between parties or individuals? And uh, lastly, uh, whom, who have to participate on the national dialogue? At the own national dialogue, I believe the parties should come together. The parties should have their uh, representatives from all parties. And then community in itself, for example, like I said, religi religious communities from Muslim communities, and um, Orthodox and uh, Protestants, Wakifata, and this community should also participate in, in these uh, national dialogues. Also women, again, women from all ethnic groups, if it is possible, at least 85 different women should be on there. How do you see the readiness of the parties who are going to participate on this national dialogue? See, um, Again, that's kind of very interesting. That's why I say at the beginning, when we come to these national dialogues, it is not about me or about this party or about that party. It is not about my ego or their ego. So I have heard some of them are not going to participate in national, in these national dialogues. I think that is foolish. And I think it's still that is ego driven uh, political um, group or individuals. Once again, it is a time to put our ego aside, to put our political toxicity aside, even from the government all the way to the guys who are opposition party. It is a time to say we are going to build a nation, a great nation, a great Ethiopia that will treat all Ethiopians equally and fairly. As an Oromo, 
sometimes when I write things, people tend to uh, misunderstand me because what we understand from the literature is about 70% of the population misunderstand written language. Some of them even think that I am not part of a Romo group, I am not this, I'm not that. I absolutely understand about our pain, what we have gone through in that country for 100, 150 years. However, if I am going to say as an Romo, this country has been treating us this way, and I am not going to compromise with anyone, guess what? There are another community who would say the same thing too. When we do that, I am not looking for solution. I'm actually one of the problem. So we need to do that at individual level, in the political organization, even at the governmental level. If I am literally sitting right here and crying about the past, that past will always, always in my head, guess what? The country will never be developed. It is a time to say, let me swallow and let me forgive all of us, especially Ethiopians. Ethiopian is actually number one country that is very religious, actually one of the number one country, about 99.9% .9 of Ethiopians are believers. So whether that, these people believe in Muslim and a Christian or Wakifata, whatever they believe in, forgiveness is priority of all text uh, holy books so they should come into these dialogues with that mentality when we do that believe it or not we can create the best nation if i tell you some personal story when i was um, when my father was killed of course my father was killed by my oromo father was killed my by my oromo people just because of different things. So I struggled so much to get over it. And I always, especially until I get to the university, I was always looking forward to do the same thing that they have done to my father. When I came to the point of forgiveness, that is when I started actually doing very well in school and living a great life. Greatness always comes with forgiveness. When we, when we forgive at individual level and at community level and national level, that is almost similar to come breaking the chain. So I ask Ethiopians, especially the Oromo people, to forgive and come together to build this nation. Because I believe unless Oromo fully participated in this national dialogue, the result is not going to be great because we are the majority of that country. Always the majority should take responsibility to build a house and to build a nation. So I'm asking all Oromos from all political backgrounds and from all religious backgrounds to come together for the sake of our children, for the sake of our future, to build this nation. Good. In general, do you think this uh, dialogue or national dialogue can pave the way for national consensus, national agreements to be all the strong and the prosperous Ethiopia? In this life, both at individual and the national level, there is nothing impossible and there is, imp there is nothing too difficult if we literally, sincerely come together, and if we sincerely participate in things that we are participating in. But if I am sitting there, if I am sitting in any group to be a problem, I am the problem and nothing will succeed. When we come together to make things happen, we can happen, something can happen, something great can happen, something great will come out of this national dialogue, I think Ethiopia will be in a better condition and in, will have a better future if we come together with a such mind. Apart from the national dialogue, when it comes to the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam, the GED has started generating uh, electric power as one who was uh, con contributing this part for the success of this project. What is or what was your feeling when you first hear about this project or the success of this project? 
Uh, literally, when I heard about this, um, a guard started generating water uh, power. That was one of the happiest days of my life. Here is why. About 12 years ago, when I graduated from University of Minnesota, I, I went to Ethiopia for a very short time. I did independent research during that time. What we find out is in Ethiopia, there is a disease thing called cataract. It is universally very known. However, Ethiopia is number one number one country that has been suffering from cataract, especially people who live in the rural area. What causes cataract is it, it makes your eye blind, actually eye blind. It makes a cloudy eyes at the first, and then if you don't have a treatment early on, a person can, can go blind. So what causes that is uh, in, our, in our country, we don't have electricity. People use these woods and different kind of um, uh, woods, right, to make their foods and everything from daily to live daily on daily basis. So, when I heard about this, God is starting generating water. Our people will see again. Our blind will heal again because we will have electricity, about 60% of Ethiopians will have electricity. That's not all. Almost about 45% of that country, the country's economy will go up. So the electricity, advantages people will be healthy again, and economy will grow faster, faster than any country around the world because of this guard generator. generator. And Ethiopia will literally, if we come together and know how to use this electric, this water, I mean, this electricity, we can develop Ethiopia within the next 15 years. That is the most beautiful thing that everybody should be very happy about. This is not about politics. This is not about Oromos, Amaras, or uh, other ethnicity. This is about Ethiopia. This is about living good life and health again. Living healthy again. So... I am very happy as an Ethiopian. I'm very proud. That is not all, um, uh, that's not all again. All East African communities will benefit from this generator. That's one of the reasons Americans were, was fighting this country to not succeed in developing this high, um, um, uh, high tech, um, uh, the generator, the guard, actually, because this will come with high technology too. Technology will be developed in, developed in Ethiopia and throughout African countries. Americans do not want that. That's kind of really what we see from the history of this country, the American countries and Africans. The same thing that's going on with Russia and Ethiopia. I mean, Russia and America, what's going on? It is about the power. The world do not want to see Africa to be the most powerful country. So this is the first step that we are heading to get power in Ethiopia and in Africa. That's why I'm very happy about that. Well, uh, Dr. Jamal, in general, what is next for all Ethiopians and Ethiopia in general in building a prosperous nation? What is expected from all stakeholders, Ethiopians living inside the country and abroad? What is expected from all stakeholders, from all citizens of the country and the government as well? It's starting from the government and all, Ethi all opposition parties and individual citizens who live in Ethiopia and outside of Ethiopia. My recommendation is again, the world has left us behind. We are so behind. Ethiopia is be behind of the world and Africa is behind of the world. When we have unlimited natural resources, this should be shame on us and we shouldn't regret for the past we should come together with such mentality. We have to develop Ethiopia, we have to develop Africa, so African children and Ethiopian children shouldn't die in Saudi Arabia, in Red Sea, in Libya, in different European countries while searching for better homes. 
there is no better homes than Ethiopia and Africa if we know how to use our resources. I have traveled throughout this country for work and for vacation. It is only about two months ago that, not even two months ago that I went to Latin America for work, Peru. Even that country, one of the poorest country, is still discriminate against black people. Throughout European countries, and even here in America, black people are not truly equal to other people. What, how, what did we learn from European country, from Ukraine right now? The immigrants, the refugees that was running away to save their, to protect their life were pushed back into the war. The refugees from Africa. Poland, Ukraine, different European countries do not have the same respect for black people. I am not going to blame this on anyone but on us, on Ethiopia, on Africa, on African countries. This 21st century, especially 2022, should be a final year for us that we fight and we bite and we eat each other like animals based on our ethnic groups, based on our tribes and subclans, and based on our religious backgrounds. We need to get into, into civilization. Cultural civilization is very important. We need to start from that. Aristotle said, uncivilized culture is full of pain, suffering, and violence. When we start civilizing our culture, that is when we start develop developing Ethiopia and throughout African countries. What is the civilization of culture? Civilization of culture is if I see someone who is different from me and what is going on actually in Ethiopia, I'm very hopeful. A group of people, I'm not going to say the ethnic group, insulted the mayor of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Nothing had happened to those group. I like that. Most people don't like that. I like that. Do you know what that tells me? Ethiopia is on the road to civilize its own culture. If I see on that day a group of people, two or three people died, that is uncivilized culture. People should have a freedom as long as they don't burn somebody's businesses down and they don't harm someone. They have a right to criticize anyone. Here in the United States, I can stand up on the street and criticize Joe Biden all day long. I can criticize white people all day long. No one even look at me. So that is a civ civilized culture. We need to civilize our culture. Then we can create the best Ethiopia that treats everyone equally in that country. That is when we will develop technologically, educationally, and economically. Dr. Jamal Hassan, I really appreciate your thoughts that you shared uh, to us and many thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for your time again. Mr. Okaba, thank you so much. I truly appreciate uh, yourself in OBN English program and it is a staff members. All right, dear viewers, this will bring us to the end of this edition. We highly appreciate you stay with our program. Till the next edition, have a good time.